It could be anything, you know, bamboo. Now, it could be anything, but when the child goes and is alive, depth is, is, is present. Welcome back to Green Planet, Blue Planet, Phil. I'm excited to have this conversation with you today. You are a repeat guest for me, a friend, a mentor, and just a shining light of embodiment in the path of, you know, education and the path of uh, you know, love-based education. And I'm excited for this conversation because I know you've you've moved since we last talked. Um, we've we've met where you now live in North Carolina, and um, yeah, you're launching a really interesting program as well to share more of your wisdom and your knowledge with the world. So welcome back. Yeah, thank you. It's always a pleasure being with you. Yeah, let's start first where you're sitting. I'd love to hear a word or two about North Carolina, what brought you there. And um, yeah, just just the, the, the change of or the transition of, of you know, um, living. You've, you used to live in Michigan for four or five decades, right? Where you, or longer, where you've um, created Uplands Hill. And, and we've met on Vancouver Island about, you know, eight, eight years ago or so. And um, now it's North Carolina. Tell, tell me about it. Yeah, well, it's quite a story. Uh, it has to do with the great mystery, for sure. I was born in Detroit, you know, mm. so um, that it has been the place where I have lived my entire life it, until it became clear to me that the school, in order for it to really continue and flourish, the best thing, and you know this about parenting, <laughs> the best thing that parents can do at some point is to really totally let go. Mm -hmm. And so I knew that about school. And, uh, and so I needed a place to go to and I wasn't sure what it was going to be. You mentioned Vancouver Island, and that was certainly on our list as a possibility. But family um, kind of won out. And also the great mystery, as I said, because in New York City, there was something called the Evolutionary Collective. And I would go to New York three weekends every year to be a part of this group called the Evolutionary Collective. My teachers there were uh, Jeff Carrera and Patricia Albert. And we were exploring a, a new kind of meditation, a, a meditation that was always done with your eyes open and you were really experiencing the now. So the question you would ask is, what are you experiencing? And we did all these permutations and uh, really interesting experiences over three days when we were together. And then in between three weekends, there was lots of practice like this. Uh, over phone or on Zoom. And there are people from all over the world. And one of them happened to live here where, where I live. And as soon as uh, he entered into our group, we started talking and he's a little younger than me. And I told him my story about wanting to let go and having let go, you know, and he asked me, how do you do that? And so so we started uh, having conversations here. I would come here and he invited me to consider coming here to this community. And, um, and then COVID happened. And then it was just the month before the quarantine, we bought this house that we're in here. And it was the perfect timing for us. Karen could no longer, my wife could no longer even begin to dream about teaching on Zoom. She had to finish her last year uh, as a Zoom teacher, she was just, it was a deal breaker. It, it was the end of her career. She knew it. Once she knew that and was ready to go, then I knew it was ready to find the place. Terry had invited us to do it here. We love the infrastructure here. There's a community feel here. You've been here. You know that there's a beautiful sanctuary. I've done meditation retreats here with Jeff Carrera. So I knew it really well, and it's really just five hours from uh, almost 24 people that I'm related to. So that made a really big impact on me because I knew that we had family built into it, you know, mm -hmm. and so our family lives all over the world. 
but um, actually very soon in this uh, July, we will have a healing retreat. There's a great trauma that happened to all families that had people who were um, destroyed in the ovens of, of Auschwitz, you know? And so in our family, there's a Argentine and a French part. And they're the very small family. They re refer to themselves sometimes as the family of sorrow. And we were an intact family because my grandfather and grandmother came with 10 children of their own and three that they adopted before World War II. So they call us the family of joy. We're going to have a reunion here, the perfect place for it to happen. Because as you know, we can put up over a hundred people here mm -hmm. and have a really great experience. And for Karen and I, these last two and a half years have been a joy because we're free in ways that we've never been free before. And, uh, you know, the role of a director of a school or the director of an ecological awareness center is kind of like being the mayor of a small town or the leader of a jazz band. You know, any of those me metaphors would work to some extent, but you were always carrying something on your shoulders and aware of something. Mm -hmm. And I was doing it since I was 23. So the only other time was my childhood mm -hmm. that I felt as free as I, I feel right now today. Well, that is beautiful. And it brings me to one of your, I, I guess, like one of the words you use most, which is rewirement. And I'd love to understand that word a bit more. I mean, you know, there's retirement and rewirement, but then there's also, I guess, rewirement as a general word, not just focused on kind of like the play on the, the word retirement. In your case, it means that, right? It's like rewiring from instead of retiring, but, but maybe you can just you know, make a, a bit of a more general explanation here, because I think it's relevant, no matter what age group someone is in is rewiring is a real process. And how would you how would you explain it? Yeah, well, of course, I would say that there's a physical and an emotional and a mental and a spiritual component to rewirement. So I would say I probably began my rewirement when I adopted Buckminster Fuller's ideas in 1970. And I just thought that everything that I was being taught by Bucky was really a different way of looking at the world. So the guy who coined the term uh, spaceship Earth, you know, and said that we're all astronauts was already rewiring a young 20 year old and an entire generation. Not everybody in the generation, obviously, but a large sector of the generation was being my generation. The baby boomers were being rewired by Bucky's philosophy and ideas and his inventions. So I see this as a part of my rewirement. The part that I feel that I'm in right now is like the fifth decade of my rewirement. And so I, I think of it as 5.0, you know? And so uh, what, what I'm doing now has much less of the responsibility that, that I had as a 23 year old. And the physical component is you're, in my case, the, the bioregion of the sweet seas is the way I think of the Great Lakes around uh, uh, the state of Michigan, is that it's really a bioregion and it's all about fresh water. And so since I was born, you know, that was my, my hard wiring was trees, hills, farmland, and fresh water. You know, and so mm -hmm. I'm rewiring here to the mountains of Northwest um, uh, North Carolina, and all of that is wonderful for us. I mean, we 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 just love the world we're in. It's a world of waterfalls, and it's the world of the Cherokee, and there's just so many things here that we're rewiring to. On an emotional level, it has to do with being with, with family again. And as we all know, family is ground zero for our becoming. So it's, you know, it's, it's, it's always whole. There's all the shadow stuff that comes with family and there's all the light that comes with family and it's more dynamic. And because we're the elders now of our family, that still seems a little strange, but we're adjusting to it. And we're doing things like I was just talking about, bringing people together and working on generational trauma. And the mental part of it, you know, has to do with really leaning into, mm. uh, you know, I'm losing my sight, I'm losing 
my hearing apparently i'm you know i'm slowing down i'm not that same driven 23 year old guy who knew nothing really only had all these ideas about a love based education and had a mentor who was like a grandparent to me you know and and all of those things i would say that the thought process is also rewiring realizing cognitive functioning and always being an achiever isn't the most important thing that you can really let go and become nobody at this stage of our life, which I really love that. There's a film that one of my teachers made, Ram Dass, uh, it's about Ram Dass and it's called Becoming Nobody. Mm -hmm. And it's a really beautiful film. And I really always was, and from a family of nobodies, you know, mm. Jews who came through Canada to, or from Poland to the United States to become individual achievers. Some people, some friends uh, joke about when does when does uh, life begin? And for some, it's the second trimester or third trimester. For Jewish people, it's like when you get your law degree or you get your MD, you know? And so for the world that I grew up in, there was a, a great emphasis on education, and I knew I was an outlier from the very beginning. I knew I wasn't going to be like my three brothers, who are all medical doctors, you know. So I've had to rewire, you know, to to a whole different thought process that was not the individual uh, achiever. And now, in this stage in my life, my rewirement is in this area of eldering, mm. and by eldering, I mean, you know. I don't even think of myself as a teacher, you know, a turner maybe because I'm learning all the time and I keep on wanting to share that learning. So I'm thinking maybe a word like turner, somebody he, who keeps turning towards what's more exciting and, and what's expanding and becoming uh, a, a better and a deeper kind of human being. You know, sometimes I think of it as being aspiring to be homo universalis, aspiring to be a citizen of the world and of mm -hmm. the cosmos, you know, in that kind of way. And that's the spiritual part. The spir spiritual part of rewirement is I spend every morning in meditation and breath work. And every, <laughs> my, I'm, I'm laughing because it's hard for my wife, Karen, we've been together for 53 years, and I know that there's challenges being married to me. <laughs> and one of them is, you know, the amount of time every day that I want to work on how to um, heal some of the hard wiring inside of us still that gets mm -hmm. in the way of what, what I sense is really possible. The love is very strong, um, but I can spend a, a good portion of every day in spiritual practice and in spiritual awareness and use every opportunity like the one when I saw you, not knowing it was really you when I saw you. And then I, and then realizing, oh my God, somehow the great mystery again has brought us together and it's just, everything lights up. You know, I just feel like this glow, this blaze of light that's like inside me, you know, just, it gets really bright. And then uh, and then I know that there are cosmic reasons why we're coming together to do something of importance, you know, so the antidote to anxiety is a certain kind of equanimity that regardless of what comes to you, you're able to function from a higher place, not always, but, but that's the aspiration. The antidote to anxiety is a place of equanimity. Yeah. That's a powerful, powerful quotable statement just right there in all of the the brilliance that you just shared. Yeah, I love listening to you like that, Phil, because, in, you know, do you describe, for me personally, like the process of, of living so beautifully and also just these, you know, you're so playful with terminology that allows us to yeah, kind of lift the mind a little bit and understand, well, there, there often is way more to it than, than we, we might think about when we pay deeper attention, right? Um, how does a place like, you know, Highland Lake, where you just moved to, we, we started the episode with, with speaking about this, how does that support you in having this time in your contemplative or more spiritual practices? Like, you know, it's a, it's a beautiful, it's called Highland Lake. So it's, you know, in Flat Rock, North Carolina, and 
just like surrounded by forest and like somewhat at the edge of the Blue Ridge Mountains. And you know, there's, there's a big lake. And how does place um, play a role in the way that uh, you personally connect to, to that, that more spiritual side of yourself? Well, as I mentioned, uh, you know, the person that I met, Kerry, in, in, uh, at the Evolutionary Collective, has in his heart and in his soul this idea of community. And, you know, we use the word often. On, and, it's a, and it's something that it, our generation, the baby boomers, was very, very struck by. How do we live in community? And it's really a challenge to make eco-villages and to make them work or to create a school or an ecological awareness center and to sustain it. And it's and there's always a, a depth of learning available. There's so much infrastructure here for it that already exists. Mm -hmm. And there's some that's being built and there's some that's being dreamed of. Just the fact that this is in, in, the, in the field here makes it an ideal place to live because there is no perfection there is no love in perfection mm -hmm. so what what we have here is this these 30 houses around a goat pasture is called the hamlet and we bought one of those these houses were really built with the idea that they would be second homes for people mm -hmm. for us it was no this is this is like being at camp <laughs> we're gonna buy a house we're on vacation every day you know we're on a field trip every day the field is here in this area so uh, all the possibilities that um that eco villages and communities and communes uh, uh aspire towards exist in the infrastructure here not just what's built but also what's being dreamed so immediately karen and i we're able to make new friends very quickly and find people that we could immediately adopt into our hearts. Then there were, you know, the family members who were coming towards us and people from our community. We we gave half a century to developing and creating and and um, and and co-authoring this beautiful community in Oxford, Michigan. And so we have lots of visitors that come, which is also wonderful because. Um, this infrastructure here allows for that. Next door to us two weeks ago were four kids who are now in their 60s, and we're calling them kids. They're mm -hmm. in their late 50s and early 60s who were there at the very first year of Upland Hills School. So they came with one of their teachers, who was our dear friend and, and a colleague, and five people lived next door to each other <laughs> for a while. And that was like, oh my gosh, you know, how many kids want to go and hang out with their elementary school teachers or their middle school teachers and be with them as friends <laughs> when they become pretty ripe adults. So we've got that, but there's also um, these new people that are coming in as well. And there's this place called Asheville. And there's these mountains called the Blue Ridge Mountains. The Blue Ridge Mountains were where Buckminster Fuller first invented the geodesic dome. So it was in 1948, my birth year, that the first dome was attempted at Black Mountain. And mm. as soon as it was put together, it was made out of strips of Venetian blind material. As soon as it was put together, it probably stayed that way for seconds and then collapsed completely imploded yeah yeah and so we we refer to it as the supine dome meaning that it just did like what you do in you know shavasana in, in yoga it just collapsed you know it didn't like break apart it just went up and then like this but bucky knew that you know there were there was a that they that he learned more through his mistakes then through his successes. And so the next year in 1949, the first dome is built. And we all know the life of geodesic domes has just been exponential since the building of that. Well, it's right here in our neighborhood is that place. So I've been there. I'm going to be going back again. In Asheville, there is an art museum that is holding a... Uh, an exhibit on the work and a legacy of Buckminster Fuller. 
And it's the first time the art museum, the Black Mountain Museum has done lots on Bucky, but it's a very small museum. The Asheville Art Museum is a beautiful, gorgeous four-story building. In April, they're going to open the Buckminster Fuller exhibit. And because I'm here, and because I was invited to be a part of the meetings, we'll be doing a world game. Uh, it, the, um, the Art Museum opens, this exhibit opens in April, and it closes in August. In June, my friend Mark Hamph and I have been invited to do an actual world game. It'll be the first time a world game has ever been done at an art museum. And so it will be doing something that is akin to what, what I experienced as a young 21-year-old when I went to Carbondale, Illinois, and, uh, and met other people who wanted to do something called World Game, uh, how to make the world work for 100% of humanity without disadvantaging the natural world. That's an infinite game. So I've been playing an infinite game all of my life, and I love referring to it as an infinite game, but all of that has to do with place. And as you know, you introduced me to Yona, who is an, is an elder and teacher of sweat lodge ceremonies mm -hmm. and other things, vision quests and things that he's in, involved with. And so all of a sudden, all of the things that I had thought I had left at, at Upland Hills are here or being mm -hmm. built. And so the place, paying attention to the place, being nimble, thinking of yourself as an infinite game player, even though you're older in years, you haven't, not only have you not lost the eternal child, mm -hmm. the eternal child is having more fun than ever before mm -hmm. because I'm no longer the director of anything, you know, right. I'm granda, you know, I'm to my grandchildren, that's who I am. And granda has more freedom, has, uh, has, has greater space in, in terms of time and lives in a vertical dimension of time that the Greeks called Kairos. So all of those things have to do with rewirement. All of those things have to do with coming to a new place and, and living in a new place by really connecting to the, the land and the culture and the people and, uh, and the sense of the mystery of how I got here, how we got here, because... I don't even think I was the author of any of this. I think it was just like being drawn or led mm. to be there. Well, you know, I, I love tuning into what you have to share, Phil, but I, I want to hook back into one of the things. And you talked about the infinite game and you kind of explained what the infinite game is. But when you talk about being drawn and being led and, you know, kind of sounds to me like uh, surrendered to uh, more of the current of life than, than making sense of every single step from the mind. Is, is that kind of like the, the infinite game that everyone is invited to step into? Or, you know, I'd, I'd love to, I love your terminology and I'd love to just hear a little bit more about what that infinite game really means. Um, also as an invitation to everyone listening to realize, like, are we playing, are we playing game A in, in society the way that we maybe were taught in school or are we playing the infinite game and really are here to, you know, create a, um, an earth legacy in a certain way? Yeah, well, uh, it's exactly, you used exactly the right word, surrender. It's the way of thinking about it is there's a certain letting go. When you're becoming nobody, what are you letting go of? Well, becoming somebody, mm -hmm. right? And when you're playing the game of the dominant culture, you're playing a win-lose game. And everybody knows, even though the person who wins the golf tournament or <clears throat> wins his fourth uh, NBA championship ring, there are tons of losers, you know, tons and tons and tons of losers. Even when you're on a championship team, you could be, consider yourself a loser even then, because you might get traded or you had an injury and you sat on the bench and you didn't play in the field. That's the game that's destroying the planet and mm. destroying the promise of humanity. And those are win-lose games. The infinite game is so very different. And as you said, there is a certain amount of being drawn means you have to be willing to be drawn. Mm. You're not really the authoring. You're not self-authoring all of these things. 
if I look back on my life and I take credit for all the things that happen, that's the story, that's the narrative that I'm telling. And I think it's a it's a bogus bullshit narrative. I think that it's just screwed up in so many ways. Hmm. If I try to tell the story in the way that I would like to, which is why I agreed to do this with you and, and I'm excited about doing it with you, then you can really talk about what's moving in your soul at this moment. And what I believe is happening is this that we're coming together in a ways and we're letting go of that self-importance and that ego and being dominated by the mind. And we're surrendering to being led by the heart and the soul's code. And that's why in working with children and being having children in our life for 50 years and really never losing our own eternal child inside of ourself, all of that <clears throat> is confirmation that the nourishment that we're getting at this point in our lives is making us even more alive and also more um, excited about that next adventure, dropping mm -hmm. your body and joining you know, into the noosphere or joining into a place where there is this kind of wholeness and deciding somehow on some bus stop bench, maybe, uh, whether to take another incarnation or not. I know that for me at this moment, it feels like I've been living my soul's code since I was a young child. Mm -hmm. And uh, and I think that if all of us begin doing that, we we kind of blend in a way that allows for uh, a cosmic um, up leveling of consciousness. It's almost like uh, like a bolt of lightning, you know, that goes in the sh in the shape of a spiral. Zoo, you know, that there, uh, when enough enough of us come together, and we lose our meanness, mm. and we gain our weeness, then, and, and it's building on the planet at this point. Some kind of High frequency happens globally. You know, this is a, the narrative I'm telling myself, obviously. Goes, bzz. I don't think you're the only one. That's why I like when you kind of just start elaborating about it because it's quite helpful to have, you know, um, that very eloquent description of, of how the, you'd call it like the power of we or, you know, going from becoming somebody to becoming nobody what that actually feels like, what that process is actually like. And I think many of us are on that journey, right? Which is, um, you know, in other words, I would say it's also about befriending the personality or the ego, but really not letting it run the show uh, and, and using it in certain moments, but really continuously surrendering it on a day by day, by week by week basis to that, let's call it higher calling or that, you know, deeper purpose or that, um, you know, surrendered way of following the breadcrumbs of the universe. And those are words I would use, but but I, I really love the distinct uh, wordings from rewirement to uh, the infinite game to, you know, becoming nobody that you've borrowed from Ram Dass. I think it's, it's, it's very helpful for us to have catalogs of language that allow us, you know, like vocabulary in a new language that allow us to kind of continuously remember that there is a different way of being. And that we as a human group at this point, we don't really know what happens fully when more and more and more of us surrender into that way of being. But I've experienced it. It's actually with you in groups. Um, if that was at Hollyhock on Cortez Island in British Columbia, or, you know, um, with the help of our friend psilocybin in, you know, uh, Highland Lake, like lots of different moments where it, you know, we, we've realized, wow, there is a phenomena happening that brings groups together in an even more powerful way as if we had one uh, personality leader or, or someone who's won the win-lose game, who's now the big guy, right? And I don't want to completely disrespect that because I think it served a purpose in our evolution. Um, and, you know, it's just as it is. But I, I do think there's like a very clear finish line to that way of being. And that finish line will lead to destruction. It leads to destruction of social systems, it leads to destruction of ecosystems, it leads to destruction of even the well being of individuals, right? And we're seeing this in the world more than ever now that if we only play the win lose game, the industrialized game, it will lead to destruction. And I think everyone who's paying attention is kind of realizing in one way or other that that's, that's part of the equation. The, the destruction equation comes from playing those win-lose games. And so playing uh, inf the infinite game, for most of us, we didn't grow up with that. So we have to rewire. 
And I think this is one of the big keys and the legacy keys in, in your lifetime that you're holding is, well, really, we need to change the way kids enter into this way of playing the game so that there's more and more and more humans that play the infinite game from the beginning. Because that way, I mean, it's going to be an unstoppable momentum, right? Um, so let's talk a little bit about what you feel most alive and called to in this uh, chapter of your life. Because I know that, you know, we're all infinitely unfinished, meaning there's always more. And um, I believe you're, you're, you're 75 or turning 75 this year, but there's there's something else that's, that's bringing you aliveness, which is sharing more of that wisdom and that knowledge. You want to want to talk a little bit about your um, upcoming course and what you're doing? Yeah, um, I'm very excited about it. There's a dream team. Uh, there's a beautiful woman by the name of Hope who lives in Quebec and Sachin Raha, Raja, I'm sorry, the, the, lives in Vancouver and um, and Bradley and Jason Gill. So there's a, a dream team that has helped me understand that to activate the contents of the book that was published in 2017 by Emergence Education Press uh, called The Future of Children, to activate it, you need to have propagation in the world of, 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 of this medium that we're using right now. And so an online offering is going to happen at the end of April. It'll be April 28th through 30th. And it's called the Future of Children um, Rewirement Training. Um, I, I've never loved the word training, but uh, rewirement training is really what I'm talking about. You know, and, and you're already rewiring. You're so quick and adept at understanding and feeling what, what is true for you so that you're beginning to rewire as, as you flow, as you go through life. And your generation and the generation, you know, uh, just below you and the generation that's still very tiny, all of Either those, younger, all yeah. of these yeah. other humans are more able to rewire more quickly and to uh, let go of the things that are really hurting us, you know, that have to do with extracting and that have to do with poisoning and that have to do with winning, but not really understanding the expense of being the winner. You know, all of those things are a part of it. And so uh, we've created a three day online experience that um, I'm very excited about. And the the hope is to get enough people there at the first one so that we can create a tribe. <laughs> that tribe will be people that are so heart-centered and so sure that the idea is to invest in children, to invest in, in bonds with children, and to create initiatives that love children into being, but also create new kinds of educational platforms, whether we call them schools or whether we call them exploration centers or whether we call them uh, an initiative to transform family vacations, whatever we might call them, whatever the, the, the words we use, at their soul, they want to love children into being. And every initiative, whether it's to create a soccer ball that's indestructible, that can go to any refugee camp, and regardless of the number of, of uh, barbed wire and glass and steel things around, will not be destroyed and will allow children to play in all of the refugee camps all throughout the world so that their play can be intact because that soccer ball exists, this initiative came through a friend of mine, Tim Yonigan, who worked with Sting to do this very thing, the One World Soccer Ball. And mm -hmm. all of those things are connected to playing the infinite game. All of the people who are really in, in investing time and energy into creating new schools, like the school that just opened you know, in Martin, South D Dakota on the Pine Ridge Reservation, my friend Mary Jo Fairhead read the book then got in touch with me. She had just retired or quit really, being the, the uh, principal of a middle school on the reservation. She had grown up on that world. She thought that if she was the principal, she would be able to do the things that she really always wanted to do for her people, the Lakota people. Mm -hmm. And then found out 
No, she was still in a box. She was still in a prison. When she read the book, we probably met, I don't know, for several months, half a year, every week on, uh, on Zoom or by phone. And now she's operating a school there. So in a very short period of time, I think it's only a, a year old, it's grown already. It's, it's a love-based experiment. She traveled to Oxford to experience Upland Hills School. She was transformed by that visit as well. She went back. She's doing that. That kind of initiative happened in a year. You know, it was so quick. That's the kind of thing that I'm excited about. Um, and yet, because I'm a nobody, <laughs> you know, I don't have the draw of some of my teachers, Deepak Chopra or, or Robert Bly, or I could go on and name the names of teachers that came to the Ecological Awareness Center, mm. you know, who I love, Gene Houston, especially, and mm. Shafali Sarberry. And I love these people, but I don't have that kind of uh, uh, credential. So it has to go kind of this way. You know, we have to find who are the people out there who've always wanted to be in action and manifest a love-based initiative. And if you're listening to this and you're one of those people, that's who we want to come to this, this um, uh, weekend um, a rewirement training called the Future of Children rewirement training i think our website is www.futureofchildrentraining just so that it's a little shorter but that's it.com so it's uh, uh, futureofchildrentraining.com and the website is up and uh, and we already have people signed up to be there uh, and we're really shooting for a number like 120 or more than that that would create a tribe. Whoever's, who, their antenna are up, they're, they're, they've quit the profession of education for good reason, you know, and now they're wondering, maybe in despair, what am I gonna do with my life? You know, this is your tribe, you know, so join us. And you could be um, my age and older and also join us because rewirement training at our age is just the greatest pleasure in the world you know, to become people that want to interact with younger generations. Some of my contemporaries like to have live in communities that uh, you, you have to be over 55 to live in that community. This is not the place that Karen and I would want to be ever. We want to have little babies in the community. We want to have we want to have doulas who are bringing people into the world with consciousness mm -hmm. and even conscious conception. We want to live with those people <laughs> that are saying, okay, if you're going to make a child, let's do it as consciously as you possibly can. And we, your tribe who love you, will be a part of loving this child into being. And so all of the things I'm talking about, I have relationships with people throughout the world who are doing all of these things, including this one that I just mentioned about being a doula who says, no, not just to bring the child into, the, into, into this world or to lose a child and deal with the grief of that loss, but to, to all the way through their lives, mm -hmm. to bring them to this age and beyond with their, um, I, I call it the sacred child that's inside each of us, with their sacred child intact, alive, and ready to learn and grow. So that's what I'm most excited about. T took a big risk, you know, spent dollars, maybe dollars I didn't have, uh, but I've never really been driven by that. So mm -hmm. I, I just say, okay, if this is what's required, this is what's re required. And uh, so high risk. But the narrative is that I, I get to play the infinite game at the level that I want to play it, you know, with the right people on, yeah. that I want to play it with. Yeah, futureofchildrentraining.com. I just pulled it up. Beautiful website. Uh, it's launching April, I believe, end of April, right? April 28th, April 28th 29th, 30th. 30th. Yeah, yeah. So if that speaks to you, go go sign up for it. I just put myself on the newsletter, Phil. I want to keep keep being informed about it before it happens. Um, yeah, and having spent time with you in this kind of space, right? I mean, what we did back when at uh, Cortez Island, Hollyhock, once again, 
a few years ago. It it's it's life changing to be honest. Like it's it's the kind of quality teaching or way of being um, that you share and transmit that you know we we've kind of lost touch for a little bit in between and then reconnected again very organically which i think was a, a beautiful way for both of us to know that like our our connection relationship as friends and also as you know um again i would call you a mentor of mine because you've really influenced the way i i, I continue to believe in this way of being um it it's life-changing in the sense that it's an affirmation to something our soul's code and you spoke about that too i'd love to unpack that a little bit more our soul's code really thrives on which is um quite a bit different than just winning or losing the win-lose game so do, yeah. do you mind just addressing this terminology soul code for for anyone who is not entirely or you know it's someone who might not like the word soul or for someone who's like what what does that even mean well it's it's trying to put a word on something that is impossible to describe and so we use the word soul to um to indicate there's this ineffable force that's living through us and many people have this sense that they're 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 borrowing this body for a, a certain amount of time and it could be very brief you know or it could be very long and that uh they're here to do a purpose I think the ancient Greeks called it the daemon, the, the reason that you were born, something that that is in you that you can try to repress and you can try to override, but the unhappiness is unbearable when that happens. And the illnesses that can occur are also unbearable. When you're living your soul's code, um, and, you know, there there. are authors like uh, Thomas More, who wrote, you know, uh, a book, Care of the Soul. And there's really good definitions, I think, in Thomas's work, so that people can look at that and get a sense that it really isn't necessarily a religious term at all. It has much more to do with uh, dimensions that are not just what we can see, feel, touch, hear, and taste. You know, it's beyond our senses. There's an invisible realm and there's invisible dimensions some of us use words like serendipity and others use words like synchronicity and that synchronicity says well so this something is meant to be this the reason that we met again you can mm -hmm. think of it the way that i would share that narrative is that the the, uh, the great mystery had more in store for us mm -hmm. so it had to figure out how to put you know julian right in my backyard literally so Literally, that I could yeah. be walking around a corner, and it wasn't really a corner, walking on a path, and and going to a medicine wheel that you know that just arrived this last year, and was you know, rocks that were taken from someplace in upstate New York, and as soon as I look at, at you, I recognize you, and then I recognize you again. You know, the first recognition was, no, you look like somebody who's just moved into our community. And then and then I realized, no, it's not Rye. This is Julian. And then when that happens, there's this kind of explosion. It's almost like what might be going on inside of volcanoes before they explode or these these this gathering of energy that needs to erupt at some point and create new land. You know, and so that that's how I felt when when that happened. And so I think when a child walks into a school, if there are people there who are uh, the adults, the teachers, the administration who are saying, we're going to take care of this soul. We're going to love, foster, nourish, nurture and and uh, cherish this soul. Whoa, that's a big difference then what are you going to be when you grow up? Mm -hmm. You have to know that now. Or if you say astronaut, then I will say, you, you don't have to worry about that one. You're already on a spaceship. You're already traveling. You're spinning at 3,000 miles per hour and you're spinning and traveling around the sun at 60,000. So you're already an astronaut. You've already got that one. You know, So you want that child to be in a question about that. 
until they say, ah, oh, this is it, the piano. <laughs> it could be anything, you know, bamboo. Oh. Now, it could be anything, but when the child goes and is alive, depth is, is, is present. Uh, a a well-meaning parent, I'm sure, asked me on a conference recently, you know, how do you how do I get my child? Uh, uh, how do I convince my child to go deep and be passionate about something? Well, that's not a parent's job. The parent's job is to be open to whatever that child signature is and to listen as deeply as possible. One of the things we'll do in the training has to do with listening. You know, I was blessed because both of my parents, my mom and my dad, were really great listeners. So that meant that their opinions weren't what was important. It just meant that I always felt like I was being listened to. Mm. And that's that's somebody who cares about the soul, right? That's care of the soul. That's what Thomas More wrote about. That when that happens, the potential for, for true change and evolution is present. Yeah, when the great mystery it can move in and uh, move beyond our, you know, kind of mind's agency or personality's agency to determine what happens next. But that's when synchronicity, I I feel like, becomes just the the the, the normal wave of reality, right? When when things have a bigger meaning than the mind can make. Phil, it's been a pleasure once again to have you on this podcast. I'm really again want to shout out your. Um, futureofchildrentraining.com for anyone to sign up or to check it out or get on the newsletter. Um, yeah, it's such a delight to be reconnected with you in this way that we shared in this episode when, you know, last October we met, November, we met um, without planning to meet at a place that you just moved to and that I happened to be for a week because uh, I was invited by someone entirely else and we bumped into each other about 15 steps away from the medicine wheel you've created, right? And so... Um, more to come, uh, I guess, is is how I would want to end this episode. Is there anything else you'd like to share or anything else you'd like to shout out or put into the the recording as we're as we're wrapping? Well, I I am so grateful to um to you for this opportunity and to the world of Upland Hills School and Upland Hills Ecological Awareness Center, and to this stage in my life where my pension is the thousand or more children who Karen and I get to carry in our hearts. But especially at this moment, I want this dream team to know that I wouldn't be in this position if it wasn't for you. Mm -hmm. So Hope Patterson is one of those people and Bradley Morris is another one of those people and Sachin Raja is another one of those people and uh, Jason Giel is another one. And um, you have uh, given me a great gift by coming together. And I really think this is how consciousness works, that we don't work as individuals. We work in these clusters. And when you have five, that's a great number to have. You have a pentagon. The top of every geodesic dome begins with a pentagon. And so when you have that, that number of people, then true magic, magic that has integrity, that holds its shape, and that can withstand the, the most uh, difficult weather this planet can throw at it. Mm -hmm. When you build something like that, and it, all it needs is five people, then really great things can happen. So my heart goes out to you five at this moment for hanging out with me long enough to do what poor Julian had to do earlier today, help me with technology so that I could try and get onto this call. Um, but, mm -hmm. um, no problem. A I big just shout wanna... out to those to those five allies and angels in your life. Thank yeah. you so much, Phil. And yeah, thank um, you, Julian. To, more to come, as I said once before. Um, so much for today. Thank you, Phil. Yeah, Wopila. Thank you. Mm -hmm.